Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Christ in Me with Addie, where we seek to live out a John 3.30 life. John 3.30 says he must become greater and greater and I less and less. Let's be real. In today's world, it can seem impossible to live out what the Bible calls us to do. Not only can it be hard to understand sometimes, but finding the time to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, to know the Bible, it can just be overwhelming. So I created this podcast so we could walk alongside each other, share some of our stories and struggles, but also where the Lord is bringing us so that we can encourage one another and stay rooted in his word. It's my prayer that you walk away from each episode saying, I know that that is Christ in me. I know Christ in me. So let's get into today's topic. Hey, Christ and Me family. So we are back with another episode today, and this one is all about brides. That's right. This episode are uh, my top tips for Christian brides. And if you're hearing that intro and you're like, well, I'm not getting married anytime soon, or I'm already married, I try to make each episode have a little bit for anyone who's listening. So whether you're single, maybe in a relationship, engaged, or currently married, I really think that there's takeaways from this episode that can apply to anybody. So maybe you're not a soon-to-be bride, but you're hoping to be married one day. I do want to preface by saying that marriage is not promised to everyone in the Bible, and it's also not the greatest achievement in a Christian walk. But I do understand why many have the desire to be married, because it's beautiful. Let's be real. We all want to be loved and wanted, but ultimately, God is our ultimate love and love story in life. But anyways, maybe you're not a soon-to-be bride. Maybe you have the hope of marriage in your future. Uh, Regardless of where you're at, even if you are married, there are takeaways from this episode that you could use later in life to help a friend who's going through their wedding season. So all that to state, let's dive into today's topic. My husband and I were married in July of 2023. So if you're listening to this episode, um, when it airs, we have been married a little under three months now. And we learned so much from the weddings we attended during our dating and engagement engagement season, but also from our own wedding season, um, God just revealed so much to us during that time. So in this episode, I will share my best tips as a Christian bride, what God taught us in the process, and the real things of importance that make the day so memorable. So I want to make sure to state too that what I'm sharing in this episode, not all of it is like, biblical, this is what the Bible says about marriage. This is like our experience, our convictions. And if your wedding day looked different, this is not like a shame podcast or anything like that. This is just me simply sharing um, what God revealed to us during our wedding process. And hopefully it um, helps point you closer to God just from hearing our story, because I think there's a lot we can learn from one another when we share. So we were engaged in March of 2023, and then I went on a mission trip to Kenya in April, and that was for 13 days. So that was a large chunk of time that I went on a mission trip, and honestly, I did not think I was going to leave in the middle of wedding planning for a mission trip, but God had different plans. Um, We applied for the house that we currently live in, and I moved in shortly after Kenya. So when I got home from Kenya, I had to move out of my apartment because my lease ended like immediately after. Then we got married in uh, July and my husband Solomon then moved into the house with us. So it was a jam-packed three months. In three months, we had to figure out how to afford everything on an extremely tight budget uh, to make the day kind of like the day of our dreams. We had to manage family drama. We had to complete premarital counseling and just all these things. So we literally couldn't have done any of it without God. And that's what I want the biggest takeaway from me sharing our experience to be is that we couldn't have done any of it without God. So my first tip, as cheesy and as unoriginal as it may seem, it's pro- it is the most important one, and that's to trust God with the impossible. That doesn't mean to trust God that he's going to make everything turn to gold the day of your wedding. And it will just be like, you know, it's not like that, not out of selfish motives, but just trust that God can do the impossible. There were so many miracles that happened during our wedding season and reflecting upon them now, honestly, it strengthened my faith so much to see how God moved for us. Um, Not because we deserved it or because we did 
anything better than anyone else, nothing like that, but simply just because he is faithful. So the verse I want to share is Ephesians 3.20, and it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. We trusted God to do immeasurably more than we could even ask on our wedding day, and we couldn't believe the miracles that he worked out for us. The first real God sign when we were starting to have conversations about getting married, the first real God sign we experienced was back in February of 2023. Uh, We weren't engaged yet, but we knew we wanted to be. So we were just kind of in the season of asking God, like, we we want to be married, but we we need a confirmation from you, Lord, that it's your will and that we can move forward. Um, But just for fun, one night we were just looking up some venues in the area to check out pricing and what to kind of expect if we wanted to get married. And I became quickly discouraged to the point of like almost tearful because Solomon and I just realized we couldn't afford any of the venues that we liked. And even the ones that we didn't really like, but we were like, well, we, we could get married there, you know, at like a public park or something. All the dates were booked out years in advance because of how inexpensive they were. We knew Solomon's lease was ending in July. So we just like really felt like, Lord, we feel called to be married by July Um, you know, and we can't really afford to get married anywhere as we're looking at this. So from a place of defeat, we prayed to God saying, you know, God, we trust you and your timing. And if it's your will, we want to be married. And then the next day, seriously, the next day, I, uh, an email landed in my inbox and it was from a venue that was fairly new. And they were like, Hey, we saw your, um, account on, I think it was through the knot. Uh, but they're like, we saw your account on the knot and we saw that you're looking for July. And we know that you're in Columbus. We're in Cincinnati, but we have one date left in July. If you wanted to check us out, Saul and I looked at the date and it was literally the exact week that we wanted to be married. Like the week his lease ended. Um, It was well within our price point. And this is kind of like minor, but the aesthetic of the building was exactly what we were going for. Kind of like Christian boho sort of desert vibes. And it all aligned perfectly. And we were like, okay, God, like, thank you for responding. And we booked that venue before we were even engaged because we knew so solidly that God was calling us there that he he had prepared a place for us. Um, and then we were engaged by the next month. So we kind of knew, I knew it was coming. Saul knew that it's, he wanted to propose. I'm not sure if he had the ring actually when we did book the venue, but I knew that God had confirmed in my heart, like this would be my husband. So it wasn't scary. The other crazy miracle that God worked out for us was with our finances. Um, Saul and I, when we first started dating, we both worked for our church. And anyone in ministry knows, you know, you don't go into ministry to make buckets and buckets of money, which I can't speak for all Christians because there are some who have misrepresented misrepresented in that area. However, my experience with ministry is that, you know, you get compensated enough to have a a fridge of food and then a roof over your head. But we both had a ministry salary and um, we were praying like, Lord, you know, we need our finances to kind of match up with our goals. And he blessed Solomon with a new job. And it was really cool because Saul had applied for the job that he got three other times and was told no, but this time he was told yes. Without that God confirmation, we could not have been married when we were. I remember when we were wedding budgeting towards the end of our engagement, we had even written down that we were going to donate plasma to make a little extra cash. We were still about $1,000 off from our projected final cost of our wedding. And again, we prayed. And that week we received a check for the exact amount of money that we needed from a very estranged family member from a really broken situation. Honestly, someone that I haven't talked to in over a decade, but frequently pray for, and they bless us with the exact amount of money that we needed. So that was another huge God confirmation that he was with us, that he was making a way for us, and that he saw us seeking to walk in his will. So all that to say, when it comes to wedding planning, if it's God's will, and if you are walking in his will, he can make anything happen. I have friends in situations right now who are like, oh, well, once I hit this certain amount of money, then I'll marry them. But it's just cheaper to live together now. And, you know, and I'm just such, 
our relationship, Saul and I, is such a testament that when you do things by the book, the God way, you know, even if it makes more sense financially to live together before marriage, we knew that that's not what God calls us to do. And that if we remained faithful to Him, walking in His will, that He would see that and He would acknowledge it. And He did, and He made a way for us. So friends, know that sometimes the harder path is actually the easier path because God is with you and He wants to bless you when you are putting Him first. My next tip is a little bit of an unpopular opinion, but tip number two, brides, we have to take a big slice of humble pie Our world commonly says, it's your day, do what you want. But from day one, I told Solomon, no, I will not be a dictator bride. This is not my day. Um, You know, it's equally special for both of us. I asked him throughout the process, like, what would you like? Do you like this? Do you like this color? Do you like this, this flavor? You know, and I feel like our world today is like, you're the bride, you decide, and he has to go along with it. And, you know, I think that that's kind of something we need to really recognize is just, yes, it is a huge day for us, but ultimately the day isn't even our day when you're a Christian. Our wedding day is for the Lord. And uh, we just went into our wedding season wanting every single guest who came out of our wedding to leave having heard the name Jesus Christ. Um, So I think too often we kind of condone bad behavior around brides and bridezillas because of the saying, it's your day. And I think it's okay to have hopes and dreams and a vision for how you want your wedding day to go, but that should never come at the cost of your character and reflection of the true meaning of the day, which is Christ. I had mentioned in the beginning that Saul and I had attended two weddings during our dating season. And something we realized at both of them is that there was so much unnecessary tension, gossip, opinions, and expectations that came on the wedding day. And we said that we didn't want any of that. And, you know, we weren't judging them or anything, but there were just some situations that we were in that were uncomfortable because it's like the greater meaning of the day wasn't being focused on. And instead it was like, I don't know who has seen The Office, but I'm going to get really niche here for a second. Um, In The Office, I also don't want to spoil anything. So if you haven't watched all of The Office, spoiler alert, I'll just say a certain somebody gets married and her veil rips and she starts crying and she's like, oh, like the veil has ripped and it becomes like this huge dramatic thing. And then she kind of wakes up and realizes like the veil doesn't matter. The veil's ripped. I'm getting married today. And I feel like that's kind of the heart posture we have to take is like things are going to happen. Things are going to fall out of line. But the real question is, are you leaving room for God to move in your wedding day? So ultimately, we just wanted to make sure that while we couldn't control how other people acted, we wanted to make sure that we were being reflections of Christ and not um, too stuck on ourselves Christian weddings are made to represent the day that Jesus will be reunited with his bride. To the church or all those who believe in him, we are called the bride of Christ. And when Jesus returns to earth for his second coming, he will collect his bride as stated in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, which again is all of those who believe in him. So all of believers, the church of Jesus, and that's not just like my home church or your home church, that's everyone who um, claims Christ, they will be collected by Jesus on his second coming and we're called the bride of Christ. And so a wedding day is supposed to reflect the union of Christ and his church in Jesus' second coming. Ephesians 5.25 says, "'Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her.'" So if you're a Christian, ultimately your wedding day and union between you and your spouse should reflect the union of Jesus and his people. It's not about the dress or the cake or the flowers or, you know, if you're a Christian bride, it's about Jesus. And so I think we just need to remember that heart posture when that bridezilla feeling starts to creep in. Which brings me to my next tip. You don't have to follow the ways of the world when it comes to your wedding day. I think Weddings, I just couldn't believe, you know, when I was scrolling on Instagram, you know, the reels and TikTok during my wedding season, I just remember thinking like, wow, the things people are doing at their weddings today, like, I don't know how we're going to compete with that. 
And I think it's important to remember that we were never made to compete with the world as Christians. We were never made to please the world, to compete with the world. We were just made to, to please Christ. And so I want to remind everyone of the verse in Romans 12 two: do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We An example of this is, We talked a lot in our engagement season about whether or not we wanted alcohol at our wedding, and ultimately we decided we did not want to provide an opportunity for others to fall to sin because I feel like the world has glorified um, weddings as like this giant drinking party where there's the lovey-dovey part in the beginning that's kind of boring. You sit there, you watch them kiss, they leave, and then like, it's time to turn up. And we just didn't want that in our wedding. Like, We believe in drinking responsibly and, you know, not being drunk, of course, because Ephesians 5.18 says, and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And note there, just because it says wine, that doesn't mean that it's only a sin if you get drunk on wine. No, it's a sin if you get drunk on any alcohol. But we wanted our friends and family to leave our wedding filled with the Holy Spirit and encouraged in the faith. We didn't want to cause a stumbling block. And while we know we can't control the actions of others, like they could bring alcohol to our wedding if they wanted. And fortunately, that that didn't happen to our knowledge. Um, We just knew how sad we would be if drunkenness was the result of our day of marriage. We wanted to reflect Christ instead of providing an opportunity to be more like the world. Um, So something I love about my close friend group is that, you know, they're all Christian at this point, but— From day one, even when I entered into the friend group, as broken as I was from a really worldly situation, from day one, they showed me how you can have a great time without alcohol. And it's funny because the woman that I was before I knew Christ, I wouldn't have been able to imagine my wedding day without alcohol. Like, I feel like from a worldly perspective, alcohol is the main source of entertainment for many. But what I loved about my Christian friend group that is now my like main group of friends is from day one, we've always just had a great time together, like deep belly laughing, great time without alcohol being involved. And I also love being around them because I know if they do drink or if we do drink together, it's not to get drunk. It's not to fall into sin. You know, we know that we all have the same kind of like moral standing. And so with our wedding day, we just, we didn't want to provide an opportunity for our friends or family who don't know Christ to misunderstand what the day was about. I also have a history of alcoholism in my family. And if you go back to my testimony episode, you can hear more about that. Um, but also the the venue was a bit of a drive for our friends and family, and we didn't want to put anyone at risk. The world has made weddings out to be, like I said, just a day of partying and drunkenness, but we knew that we could enjoy the day, stay fully present with God, and still have an amazing celebration without drinking. It was one of my favorite choices that we made for our wedding, and we opted for a coffee bar instead. And this is a cool like little God part, but We hired this coffee cart that was called Solo Coffee Company. And upon talking with the the couple who owned the coffee cart further, we found out that their name actually was Solo Cristo, which means in Christ alone. And they were a Christian couple. And we even got to pray with them at our wedding reception. And so it was just so cool to see how God like intertwined even there. Um, And they bless us so much, just their presence at our wedding. And the coffee cart was a huge hit. So all that to say— I see a lot of like different aesthetic drinking themed things at weddings. And I do believe that you can drink responsibly. But for example, one that kept coming up as I was on Pinterest, you know, for hours trying to plan our wedding is there were like seating charts that were walls of shots and, you know, like all these different things. And while we don't judge anyone who chooses that for their wedding, we just wanted the entertainment and the highlight of the evening to be rooted in things that bring light and life and not sin. So again, we believe you can drink responsibly, but this is just one example of how the world overly glorifies like cocktail hours. And we just want it to be set apart. We didn't want to do what everybody else in the world is doing. So in being set apart, my fourth tip is to add biblical elements into your ceremony and reception. And again, this is just for Christian brides, some fun ideas. 
Um, personally, we did communion and worship during our ceremony, and it was seriously so beautiful. I, I love looking back on the pictures, and that moment is forever ingrained in my mind. I will never forget the sweet tear that I watched roll down our pastor's cheek as he held up the bread and the wine, and he spoke the words from Matthew 26 over us, which is when Jesus, you know, pretty much teaches the disciples how to do communion. He says, this was my body broken for you. And he holds up the cup and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And just the tear that rolled down his cheek as he saw our love for Christ, but also our love for one another, that that's a moment that is just ingrained into my heart. So our brother and sister-in-law led everyone in singing the blessing as our immediate family came up to the front and we had a prayer circle after communion we had a prayer circle where our immediate family could come up and just sing over us and pray over us. And um, what was so moving for me is that members of my family who are not active Christians even prayed over us, even prayed over us. Um, and Saul and I were like moved to tears because we truly believe that they were moved by the Holy Spirit to participate. And we just saw God move on our wedding day, and that's all we wanted. During the reception, we made sure to have someone pray over the food before it was eaten, and we just made sure that everyone in attendance, Christian or non-Christian, knew that we would be a house for the Lord and that everything we had on our wedding day was because of God. We also had a custom family Bible made, which um, on my Instagram, I kind of shared this if you want to get I made a reel on it if you want to go back and watch and see what it looked like. But on the front, we just had it— um, basically printed like our family name and our wedding date. And then we had guests sign the front and they could highlight a verse for us as well if they would like. And now that sits on our coffee table at home and I can't wait, you know, if the Lord blesses us with kids one day, I can't wait to sit there at the family Bible, look up verses together, have family Bible study and just have that be, you know, it's going to be so meaningful for the rest of our lives. I've even seen couples do a foot washing ceremony to reflect when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Um, we also made our own playlist of clean Christian EDM songs, dance songs, and more instead of opting for the DJ playlist. So we definitely still had like secular music in our DJ playlist. We just made sure that, you know, the, the lyrics were clean and that, you know, we just wanted to be set apart reflections of Christ. And that's not to say like cast away of all things secular, because again, we didn't want to be like overkill that people who weren't Christian just felt like completely ostracized. But we just wanted the love of Christ to be the forefront of the day. What seems odd to others is beautifully significant for those of us in the faith. And at the end of the day, no one is going to forget that. My fifth tip is drama is a choice. Man, oh man, let me, <laughs> this is gonna ruffle some feathers. But anyways, when it arises, because drama just seems to come around weddings, and I'll get into that. But when it arises, make sure you never consider yourself above others. Brides, I know that the world says it's your day, you decide, it's for you. But that doesn't mean that we become elitist to the people in our lives that love and care about us. So yes, people are coming to your wedding. Yes, you get to choose every aspect of your day. And yes, people are coming just to be a witness. But we have to remember the people who attend our weddings are coming because they love you. So remember that. When tension arises, when Aunt Matilda gives her opinion about something that goes against what you wanted, they love you. Remember that. Don't let those little tensions bubble up into something unnecessary. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So it's easy as the bride to get upset when you hear the opinions of others on how they think your day should go, and it's easy to let that cause a riff or tension. But if you humble yourself to continue your day the way you planned it, um, the way you want it, while acknowledging the feelings of others and allowing for forgiveness, the whole day will just go a lot smoother and a lot happier. I don't want to out people at all, but the two weddings that I mentioned, we just saw like these little tensions, fights in the family, and just things like awkward moments that arose because they weren't handled like before the wedding day. And so just remember to lead with love. It's better to over-communicate than to allow like 
passive aggressiveness to boil over. And so I want to give one example from our situation with our wedding planning, but we had to make the difficult decision during our wedding to not allow kids at our wedding, which really upset some family members and friends. Unfortunately, the decision was perceived as like us following a trend. Like it's just trendy to not have kids at your wedding these days. But for us, it was like literally just inflation. It was not a trend. It was inflation. We were on a very tight budget financing our wedding on our own. You know, I just paid for mission trip things and down payment on the house. And ultimately, that's just what we had to decide because there were so many kids. And it's like, you can't tell one person they can bring their kid and then nobody else because then they'll be mad at you and mad at each other. It's just, it was kind of messy, but here's how we handled it. Instead of getting upset with those who were upset with our decision, we we kind of talked it, off, talked it out, um, brushed it off. We focused on Christ, forgave despite the, the tension, and we moved on with our day. So Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving of one another as God in Christ forgave you. So this verse is really about forgiveness, but if you read the beginning, it says, let bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor and slander. So that means gossip. It's really easy to be upset and run and talk to one family member about the other family member and little bitterness, you know, boils up until it just turns into this big, ugly thing. And this is saying, forgive. God forgives you. You forgive others. Christ is the center. At the end of the day, this is supposed to be a happy day. So all that to say, people joke that weddings bring out the worst in others or weddings bring out drama. But I reject that thought in Jesus' name. And I said that to one of our family members, and I'm not going to say who, but their face kind of dropped because when they said, you know, weddings bring out drama, I responded by saying, I think that's an immature thought. We choose drama. We choose how we speak. We choose how we react. And again, we can't control the actions or the words of others. But we have to remember at the end of the day, the people coming to our wedding are the people who love us most. And we have to treat them as such, whether we're the bride, whether it's our day, whether it's our decision or not. They're still our family and they deserve deserve our love and respect. So don't let being the bride convince you that you're above everyone, that you can mistreat others. Um, but also don't let the opinions of others keep you from having the day you envisioned. It's a fine balance. It's a fine balance. With that, someone gave me great advice. This is someone else's advice, so not necessarily one of my tips, but another additional tip is they said, actively spend the day with your spouse. The day goes by so fast, and I'm sure if you are a bride planning a wedding, it's you've heard that a lot, but it's true. It really does go by so fast. And Solomon and I truly spent our wedding day together versus going through the motions on how the day should flow. So we made sure all of our guests felt loved and appreciated, but ultimately we focused on spending the day together, focusing on Christ and our union and all the things he worked out for us to, to get married instead of entertaining our guests and trying to be the most epic wedding ever. You know, we just, we focus on each other and Christ. Um, my last tip is don't break the bank. Don't compare and don't let the expectation of the world pressure you into overspending. Unless you're like Elon Musk's child or something, your wedding day will not be the most epic day in the entire world. Like you will not have the best wedding that ever happened in the history of weddings. Like I feel that way about mine, but it's for different reasons. It's not because we had the most grand floral arrangements or like I had the most expensive dress on or I had the biggest ring on my finger, nothing like that. But I believe my wedding day was the greatest in the whole entire world just because we let God move that day. You know, there there is beauty in worldly things. There is beauty in having a big old shiny rock on your finger and having, you know, the most amazing princess dress on or, um, you know, the most expensive nail set on for the day of. But those things are so minor in the grand scheme of things. So during the planning process, I talked about how I was scrolling on Instagram and stuff. And, you know, I would see these these arrangements and these vendors that I was interested in. And I'd be like, okay, let's, let's see how much that was. And, you know, I'd find out that the floral arrangements they had 
cost over $100,000 and that their dress was like $30,000 and and so on. And I was getting so discouraged. I was like, we're not going to have anything like that. And the art and the vendors, I mean, they were worth that cost. It's just that we couldn't afford anything remotely like that. And I had to kind of remove the expectation in my mind of how I pictured our wedding day based on what I had seen online versus what we could actually afford. So personally, I DIY'd a ton on our wedding, and I'm so grateful for all we had and all that we were able to do. But don't let what you see online convince you that you need to do more, to spend more, and be better. We were really careful about managing our finances during our wedding because we didn't want to start off our marriage like completely broke from overspending. Instead of giving into the culture of overspending, because that's what weddings have become now, we prayerfully considered like every decision we were making from finances to just everything. So if you have the means to go all out on your wedding, that truly is amazing. And I don't speak from like a place of being jaded at all, but from a convicted place, because I think we're so self-focused in our country And when I say from a convicted place, it's because I had just come from a mission trip in Kenya where I saw people struggling to even eat every day to then going home and wedding planning. And it was like, I think the average American spends $33,000 on their wedding now a days. And that is a life-changing amount of money for someone in Kenya, like the areas that I was in. People you know, hoe all day in, in fields, you know, they're, they're working farmland, they're harvesting things. And I asked, um, the Bishop that we were working with in Kenya, I was like, how much do they make a day? And he said, they make two to $3 a day. And so when you think about $33,000 for one day in your life to get married versus $3 a day for someone in Kenya, just trying to eat to live, you know, it, it really puts into perspective what is important in life. And I'm not saying that if you don't give all the money that you're saving for your wedding to Kenya, like you're a bad person. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, I think as Americans, we really need to have some perspective sometimes. And not just Americans, you know, it's for any anyone who can relate um, from a place of like having abundance versus, you know, how some other areas of the world are really struggling. It just really gave me perspective when I came home. I didn't need to come home and try to compete with all of these Instagram viral weddings I was seeing. I just needed to do what God was calling me to do with the means that I had to set myself up for success and ultimately not forsake our um, our tithing. Like God always came first. We were never going to do something extra from our wedding at the cost of not being able to give to the church, to the ministries we support as a family uh, anymore. So I think keeping your priorities is really what is most important. Um, Solomon and I said from day one that our spending on our wedding would never come before our tithing and our giving to cause um, greater effect outside of just ourselves and our heart for ministry. So those are my tips. Uh, Throughout the wedding process, it's funny how, you know, when you hear when people hear you're getting married, they just kind of start giving you like unsolicited marriage advice. And I find it endearing, but after a while it was kind of like, here we go again. Um, especially when they hear that you're taking that next step. But what we heard the most from that unsolicited advice was the day won't go exactly as planned, but it's okay. Just enjoy it. Or, you know, things will come up, but it's okay. Just enjoy the day. And I can honestly say our wedding day was so peace-filled, so prayer-filled and drama-free. Nothing went wrong, at least from what we knew of. But our brides, my bridesmaids told me that nothing really went wrong. Um, And I think it's because we didn't go into the day with blaring expectations. We were able to just be present, enjoy our time. And we even moved everything up on our wedding day by an hour, like ahead of schedule because of how well set up went and how like, Everyone was just gelling and getting along. And like, it was just such a smooth day. And I think a lot of that has to do with like, you know, my friends told me like, you were such a chill bride. And I I really think that's like the heart posture. That's the Jesus in me that made me calm and relaxed and just grateful that day. Like I was just grateful for everything we had, for everyone who showed up for us. And 
It's when we start putting those blaring expectations on people and ourselves and our spouse that like just causes tension. And so when you keep Jesus at the root of it, I think that's that's where the peace flows from, you know? So another quick quick story. It's just, I remember on our wedding day, it was 104 degrees. Our ceremony was outdoor and the heat was really getting to some people. And just as we were about to say our I do's, I remember a big storm cloud rolled through and gave shade and the temperature dropped a couple de- degrees and a light breeze came in and it started blowing. I had a super long veil that I borrowed from my sister-in-law actually. And it started blowing in the wind. And I just remember in that moment, I just felt like the breath of God, like the spirit of God moving. And honestly, it was so like majestic. I I just felt the presence of God so strongly. And that's what the day is truly about. Your wedding day should be a greater reflection of how you will live for Christ throughout the duration of your wedding. We allowed God and the spirit to move in our wedding day and I mean, that's how we want to live the rest of our lives. That's how we want to posture, you know, my husband and I, the rest of our lives is always reducing our expectations of what we think we deserve and what we need and how we want things to go and just allowing God and the Spirit to move. I'm not sharing all of this to say we did our best. We're, we we did our wedding day the best out of anyone. And it's not to shame you if you if you were a bridezilla. I mean, maybe you look back and you're like, oh, not my finest moment, you know. But I'm sharing all this to say that God was with us on her wedding day. And it was truly one of the happiest days of our lives because we allowed room for God to be the forefront of the day. And we allowed for the spirit to move. And he truly showed up for us. So if you're married now and that's not how your wedding day went, that's totally okay. Maybe you can help another friend later in life who's getting married or or soon, who knows, um, have that heart posture as it approaches her day to not perpetuate this idea of it's your day, be a bridezilla, you know, and instead say, this is the Lord's day. What a victory he has won in your union today. You know, hell lost another one. And that's not to say that getting married is your salvation or anything like that. But I think there's something so powerful about that's my story. So if you haven't heard my testimony, you know, I just see the power in the redemption story of how God took me as a woman from a broken home who experienced sexual brokenness later to a woman who roots herself in the word, who now lives a God glorifying, lives out a God glorifying, God glorifying marriage. There's just beauty. There's absolute beauty in that. So God can work in all things. And I'm grateful the Lord made me aware of them before I was married because honestly, the person I am today, the person I was when I got married is definitely not who I was five years ago. Like I said, I couldn't have pictured my wedding day without alcohol five years ago. But he's moved a lot in my heart and now I'm sharing to hopefully hopefully help future brides reflect him on the day that they marry. And again, marriage is not the greatest achievement in a Christian walk. Marriage is not promised to every Christian woman. There's beauty in singleness. There is um, beauty in marriage. And I think at the end of the day, it's just important to remember we are not greater than God in any situation, not even on our wedding day. And being a bride is not an excuse for bad behavior, bridezilla behavior. So I'm going to get off my soapbox. Those are my wedding tips for Christian brides. I really hope that this helps someone. And if you're getting married soon, reach out to me. Um, I'd love to start a list of names for brides who are getting married soon to just pray over you guys. And this is such a fun and exciting season. I'd love to share in it with you. If you're not dating, not engaged, maybe you're single, I hope that you take all these words to heart for the potential of marriage in your future. I want to say thank you for listening, guys, and I will see you next time on Christ in Me with Addie.